Good afternoon, class. Let's get started. Uh, today, the goal is to maybe in the next 15 minutes finish up uh, a conversation about optics, a little bit about how cameras and telescopes, and maybe the human eye works. And then uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. So we've been talking a lot the last couple weeks about electromagnetism, electromagnetic radiation, photons, and light. Uh, we're going to zoom in a little bit on the electro part of electromagnetism starting today, hopefully, if we don't get too sidetracked talking about optics and things like that. OK, so a quick review. Um, last class, I ran through a bunch of examples of optics, optics just being how we humans can bend light using mirrors and lenses to our advantage. A good example of that is your own eyeball. Your own eyeball has a little sensor in the back called a retina. And in order to see something, in order to perceive just about anything, especially if you want to read, which takes pretty good focus, if you want to be able to see something, you need to be able to focus that image. So your eye has a lens. So if, if I was trying to read something, and I've got letters and words on this piece of paper, and I was trying to see the light coming off of it, that light is just dispersing as it enters my eye. It would continue to disperse and would just be a big blurry mess in the back of my eye if I didn't have a lens to refocus that. So you can see in that picture. So the pencil on the left is what I'm trying to look at. And as you can see, the pencil on the left is sort of acts as a source of light as light bounces off that pencil. And that light goes in every direction and is getting further and further away. You can see it's being dispersed. And so it's, it would be impossible to see that pencil if I didn't have a lens taking in that light and bending it back to a focus. And so you can see on my retina, I have a very small upside down pencil. And the way I got that small upside down pencil was by focusing the light with a lens. Now, the way a telescope or a microscope or a camera works is in order to focus on something, I move the lens. So if you've ever seen like a pirate focus on something, they usually just have two concentric tubes and they move they move it like this, that's just moving two lenses relative to one another. If you've ever zoomed in on a camera or focused a camera or projector, you're moving, you're physically moving a rigid lens back and forth. Our eyeball is a little more tricky than that. So if you were to watch someone's eye as they focused on something close and then far away, you wouldn't watch a rigid lens move farther and closer away. What you'd watch is a lens actually change shape. And so your eyeball actually has muscles that squish the lens a little bit and change its focal point. That's unusual. There are glasses that do that. Um, somebody developed uh, some glasses for uh, really impoverished areas, and they have water lenses that you can actually just turn a knob, and it squishes the water in the lens and changes its shape. And so you can distribute these lenses to a whole village, and everyone can just turn their own knob and get their, get their uh, basically their prescription right there on the spot, which is nice. But most glasses are fixed, rigid lenses, and you have to move something farther away. Uh, our, our eye is a little bit different. Um, but let's, I have an example up here of kind of how that works. So not, it wouldn't be an example of the, how the eye works, but it would be a better example of how a camera or a projector or something like that works. But it's the same idea. I'll probably turn the lights down a little bit to do that. Let's go. Here's my, here's my model of an eyeball, if I can get that to come up on that uh, piece of camera. I think that's what I want. Oh, it was on the whole time. I just couldn't see it. OK, so um, what you're seeing right now on that screen, what you're seeing is the image captured by this camera. So let's call this your eyeball. This is what we're trying to see. This right here is your retina. So this screen right here is what you're seeing up there. This is your retina, and your, this, is, this is a model of your eyeball. You're trying to see those three light sources right there. Those three light sources are three different distances away. Let's make one even further away. Get that guy over here. So I've got three different distances. So in order to focus on them, I need a lens, first of all, and that lens needs to be the right distance apart, distance away. So each one of these light sources just has light emanating out and going 
further and further away, or you can think of it as blurrier and blurrier. It's not focused. And so I need, if, if I want to see that, I need to bring that light into my eyeball, and I need to focus it on my retina. The screen, which you're seeing up there, is my retina, and here's my lens. And so as I move, as I move the lens further and closer apart, you can, start, you can see that everything's blurry, and then as I focus it, I can focus on something close. That's the filament of that first bulb, so you can see that this guy's in focus and those guys are blurry. I should next then be able to focus on that uh, coiled fluorescent tube there. So if I keep zooming, that one on the left is in focus. And then if I keep zooming in further, I should be able to get the one on the right in focus. Now, a couple things to notice about that. First, those objects are upside down. I hope you can see that. That uh, maybe the easiest one is the, the far, right now, the one that's, to me, as I'm looking at this, it's on the far left. The image, it's on the far right. You can also see it's flipped upside down. You can kind of maybe see the base of it is up in the sky as opposed to down below. And you can see that also on the fluorescent tube. So here what's happening is I'm actually, you can see it in that picture up there as well, as the light is focused, it gets flipped upside down. And like I said last class, your brain since the day you were born has just learned how to flip it right back the other way. So as you're walking around, you don't have to think, okay, that's actually the floor, that's the ceiling. Your brain does the adjustment, but what the image you're getting is actually upside down and inverted. Okay. And also you can see that the rays of light as they move away are being focused. The further away the source, so that farthest one, the further away, the more parallel the beams are when they get to me. You can imagine, so that pencil right there on the left is pretty close to the lens, and so those, those uh, three red lines are pretty far from parallel, right? As they've gotten to the lens, they're kind of spreading out. You can imagine a source that was really, really far away. By the time the beams got to your eye, they would all be relatively parallel, and it wouldn't take as much bending. It wouldn't take as much bending, so it would be easier to focus. Question in the way back. Yeah. Let's see, I think your eyes start working in utero, but I, I, I imagine that it takes a little while for a baby, once they're out in the real world, to realize, oh, okay, that, that's the ceiling, that's the floor. So I imagine there's a learning process when they're first forming images and learning how to, I mean, totally, oh, I did take a child development class, so you guys can remember. But um, yeah, they, uh, you, everything's blurry anyway when you're born. You're not, your, your eyes are learning, learning still how to focus. The muscles don't work very well. Um, it's a while till you can focus on anything further than like a few inches. But as your brain is going through the process of learning how to use these things called eyeballs, one of the things it has to do is learn that everything is upside down. Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't talked, we've talked a lot about humans. We haven't talked much about animals. Um, most animals have this a similar setup to us with a retina and a lens and an optic nerve and all that. Um, we are trichromats. We see RGB. Uh, certain animals are dichromats. I think dogs are more sense. You know, it basically, it's kind of it's kind of a survival benefit thing. So for us, I don't know. I guess there's a survival benefit between to be able to see color. Uh, certain uh, like night hunters are more sensitive to lower frequencies of light. That are more more sensitive to low light conditions. Um, yeah, but most of them operate a similar setup. Eyes, are, I mean, like, a, like a, if you see a cat or a deer at night, their eyes will be really shiny. You can see them, like, in the headlight, deer in the headlights kind of thing. And uh, that's because they actually have reflective surfaces in the back that bounce light inside the eyeball to make it even easier to hunt at night. So we haven't talked really much about, yeah, the structure of I don't know, spiders and fish and stuff like that, but uh, they're all similar, really. Yeah, that's a, a good question about, um, like, I think, yeah, Hawkeye. If you are, I think hawks and eagles can see for really, really far away, can focus on small things. Um, let, let's see, what would enable that? So the structure, yeah, the structure of the eye can focus probably more precisely. It's probably easier to focus on something very far away. Um, 
yeah, there's probably several structures that would aid that. Also, our, yeah, well, and then it's, our processing is different too. And so, like, humans process, uh, some, some animals process patterns better or, or recognize motion better. Um, shoot, I have a video that we maybe should try. That, mm, maybe later, I, yeah, I have a video that maybe we'll try to show that in a minute. But, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like, the structure of a, an eye that a hawk would have would enable you to see things, what, further away, right? Yeah, small things. Um, probably even just a bigger pupil to allow in more light, I think, would be one thing. So just, um, we have a pretty small pupil for the size of our eyeball. That allows us to focus on, li uh, that, that gives us like a large depth of perception. And so maybe hawks trade off depth perception for ability to see things farther away, zero in on like a mouse or something. Great question. Okay. Yeah, I might have a video later we have to watch. We'll see if we have time. Um, so that's, that's, this is a pretty good model of, of how the eyeball works. It's also how a camera works. I have a couple quick pictures of, of that. And so you can see that I need to focus on the sensor. So nowadays, just about all of our cameras are digital. And so we've got an actual light sensor inside the camera. Back in the day, you would actually put light sensitive film in there and that film would be exposed by photons hitting it. Um, nowadays, you just have a little sensor that collects photons and the, the sensor is literally just a, a r rows and rows and rows of little sensors, a lot more like a retina actually than film. And then th that just picks up those photons and says, okay, that's yellow and that's blue and, and you snap a picture. Now that let that where, when you have to have a lens to focus the light on that sensor. So if the light is focused in front of or behind the sensor, it's blurry. That's that picture on the left. And also you can see that the lens has to move based on how far away the object is. So if you've ever used a camera that has an actual lens, you've either had to turn with the knob, you've actually had to turn with the knob uh, to actually move the lens, or if it was an autofocus, you might have actually seen it move back and forth. And so if you've ever had a really nice camera with a big lens with autofocus, you can watch the lens move forward and backward, and that's just focusing on things different distance away. Now, let's see, most of our cell phones have a camera like the size of a grain of rice. It's kind of crazy. One of the things that, I don't know if you call it an advantage or disadvantage of when you have such a small lens, the, most of our cell phones nowadays have very small lenses, so just about all the light is parallel as it comes in, and that makes for a much larger depth of field, a much larger s range that is in focus. And so when I have a very, very, very tiny lens, as stuff comes in, not much is out of focus. But you can see in the top picture, with a very large lens, I only have a very specific range that's within focus because those beams are not coming in parallel. As they come in parallel, everything's in focus. And so that's why, like, yeah, your cell phone camera's always gonna be able to take a picture of a mountain or something like that. Or, yeah, mountains are almost always in focus because they're, they're, those light beams are coming in parallel. But uh, you may have noticed your, if you ever try to take a picture of something up close with your phone, you can only get so close to it before your phone just can't focus on it. Your phone is physically moving a real lens back and forth, but it has to bend that light. And if the, if the object, I guess this is a better picture, if the object's really close, it has to bend it more. And there's just a limit to how much your phone can do that, how much the lens in your phone Especially those, lens, those lenses move, you know, like a millimeter or two. Um, our demand for smaller and smaller phones is probably driving the camera people crazy that they have to make, they have to cram a camera into something that small. It's, it's insane that they've even figured out how to do it. Um, but that's why if you have a nice camera, the big lens, you can, I don't know if anyone's ever taken a photography class or something like that, you can, like fo you can focus on somebody where like their nose is in focus but their eyes are out of focus. The depth of field is so narrow. But you need a big fat lens to do that that's collecting a lot of light Collecting a lot of light, which is nice, but then, like I said, advantage or disadvantage, you have to bend that light in order to focus it. Okay. A couple of other quick examples. Oh, by the way, so what I've been describing is like, you know, here's a pretty simple setup. I've got one lens, one sensor. That's how my eye works. I have one sensor, one lens. So not to disparage eyeballs. Eyeballs are great, but they're a pretty simple setup. If you actually get into cameras and how they work, it's insane, actually, what's going on inside a real professional camera these days um, with, like, zoom telephoto lenses and zoom lenses and fisheye lenses and tilt-shift lenses. They're, they're, they're bonkers. 
Um, much simpler, we can talk about telescope. So like I said, if you've ever seen a pirate um, focus on something in the distance, a pirate telescope is pretty straightforward. It's just two lenses that you move back and forth. Uh, my first telescope was similar. Hopefully everyone had a telescope when they were little. My first telescope was a lot like that picture right there. So basically what you have is just, well, let's see, you want to you wanna go see the moon at night. You can go outside and just look. That's not a bad way to do it. Humans are pretty perceptive. We see pretty well. And you just go outside and look at the moon. Now, my eyeball has a 1 8 inch hole, you know, about the diameter of a pencil in my eye. That's how much moonlight I can get in. So if I want to see features on the moon, I'm relying on a, a hole about the diameter of a pencil. That's, that's not a lot of light. So in order to aid that, I go put a big lens that is, you know, like, just even like your cheap toy store um, telescope's going to have maybe a, a lens, you know, several inches in diameter. That's much bigger than an eyeball. And so that's going to collect a lot of light, and then all you need to do is focus that light using a lens or two, and that's about it. So usually I've got one lens collecting all that light and focusing it, and then a second lens down closer to me that I can adjust to focus right on my eyeball, and I can see a really nice picture of the moon. So if you've never done that, please do that. Go get like a $50 telescope, go borrow one, and go look at the moon. What you can see through this is so much crazier than what you can, you can see actual like shadows on craters and stuff. It's, everyone should do that. Okay. Um, so that's your basic telescope. Now, it wasn't long before we wanted even better telescopes. And the downside of this type of telescope is it's relying on lenses. Lenses work, as we've talked about the last few days, lenses work by bending or refracting light. That's frequency dependent. And so when I'm looking at something that I want to see much detail, especially color detail, using a telescope, I'm going to get a kind of a weird image because I'm bending light and the purple is going to bend more than the red. And I'm going to get distortions based on that because I'm using a refracting telescope. So refracting telescopes can only get you so far. All the really nice telescopes we have these days are not refracting but reflecting telescopes. And the main difference being I'm using a mirror instead of a lens. And so in, for a lens, the light has to pass through the lens. And when it passes through the lens, I get distortions. When I'm using a mirror, all the light just bounces off the mirror, and it's just being reflected, and there's a lot less distortion. And so in that picture, what you can see is light. I'm, same deal. I've got a big aperture letting in lots of light. I can see the moon really clearly. I just bounce the light a couple times into my eyepiece rather than refracting the light a couple times. And I can, so if once you go to the toy store, once you're done with your $50, telescope, you want to up your game a little bit, you want to see maybe a spot on Jupiter, maybe even see a galaxy, take a nice picture of it, you're going to need maybe a nicer telescope. The nicer ones are usually going to be reflecting telescopes, a little bit like that. Okay. Which brings us to our first eye clicker of the day. So let's do an eye clicker. By the way, you'll notice in that picture, yes, that secondary mirror is in the way. And that's just the price you pay for a reflecting telescope. So your second mirror is actually kind of in the way. And so the picture you get has a, has a hole in it. But you can usually adjust for that. OK, here's our eye clicker for the day. How many galaxies are in that red square right there? So there's a picture of the sky. And there's the moon for scale so that the moon is, uh, I think, 20 or 20, maybe 20 or 50 times larger than that square, just so from perspective. So imagine you're looking at the sky. There's the moon. And just to the down, lower left of the moon, there's a square. I have to click go, don't I? Yep. Um, just to the lower left of the moon, there's a little patch of sky about a 20th the size of the moon. And you're going to take a picture of it. You're going to look at the galaxies in that square. Oh, 
good I didn't trick most of you. Okay, three more seconds. All right, looks like most of you guys got that. So that's a this is a true story. Uh, when was when we first time we first time we did this was in the '90s, and then we did it again in the early 2000s, like 2004, if I remember right. Hubble telescope, great device. It's very busy. It's, it's being used all the time for, for scientific research, and it's been up there a while, and the early in the mid 90s and then again in like 2004 they had this crazy idea they said let's point Hubble this great telescope we have at a blank patch of sky and so there's a little blank patch of sky you can see inside that red square there's nothing it's black right so we took the Hubble telescope and just pointed it at this dark black empty patch of sky and let's see this is what they saw move the cursor out of the way. That's what they saw. It's blank. It's empty. So they just, but they said, let's just, let, let's borrow some Hubble time and let's leave the exposure open. Let's leave the exposure open for a month. Let's just point the camera at a blank spot of, spot in the sky and leave the, leave the shutter open for a month and just allow light to enter. Now it's pretty much black, so maybe in a month that's still what we'll see. But over the course of a month, what developed over the course of a month, not, yep, there it comes. Over the course of a month, they actually eventually were able to see that. That's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's about 10,000 galaxies in that picture. And we're talking a spot of sky that you, with your thumb you could block it out. So with your thumb you could block out almost the whole moon, so it's even smaller than that. So at arm's reach you could block out this little square, this black spot of sky called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And so the Hubble just looked at it and it's black, it's black, and after a month, which was about a million seconds of exposure, so they just left the shutter open for about a million seconds, they eventually were able to see about 10,000 galaxies, each galaxy containing maybe 100 billion stars. And that's in a spot of sky that you could cover with your thumb. That's that tiny, tiny spot of sky, maybe a millionth of the overall sky they found 10,000 galaxies in there. Kind of nuts. And that is the Hubble, that was using the Hubble Space Telescope, which is very similar to that last telescope I had on the screen. It's just a big reflecting telescope. It's up in orbit, which gets it above the atmosphere, which is nice. It's just an orbit. And it's a big reflecting telescope. It's, I don't know, maybe it would fit in this room. Yeah, it would fit in this room. It's big. It's not ridiculously huge. It's something like, I don't know, 10, 20 tons. Maybe, yeah, it would roughly fit in this room. And it's just got a huge mirror. You can see that big mirror in the back. A huge mirror, a huge mirror that just collects photons all day long, reflects them to that secondary mirror, which then bounces them back to the instrument panel. And so I've got a hole in the back of that mirror. So I'm in my primary mirror, I've got a hole that the light goes back through, and that's where my sensors are. And we've, um, it's, it's sensitive. It's sensitive to visible light, but it's also sensitive to other frequencies, which is nice. So we can get really deep pictures of what's out there. It's a huge aperture. We can leave it open for a long time, and it's sensitive to a lot of frequencies. So it's basically an eye on the universe, way better than anything we've had in the past. Um, here's another picture that I've had up several times before. Just as a reminder, one of the reasons we put the Hubble telescope, I think that's that thing in the middle, one of the reasons we put the Hubble telescope above the atmosphere is our atmosphere blocks a lot of frequencies, which is good for us until you're trying to do astronomy. If I want to see those frequencies, a ground-based telescope is usually not very useful for that. And so if I want to see a lot of uh, infrared and ultraviolet light, I need to put my telescope in space. That's why we have the Hubble Space Telescope. That's why we're eventually going to have the James Webb um, something something telescope, advanced something telescope or something. It, it's going to be even better. Um, and also you can see in this picture why radio astronomy works particularly well on Earth. 
our atmosphere is pretty transparent to radio frequencies. So uh, radio astronomy is something that has been very useful over the last few decades. And we just had these big telescopes, well, telescopes, you could call them telescopes, that are looking not at the visible part of the spectrum, but are looking at radio waves. And a lot of the stuff we're trying to observe out in space is not just emitting visible light, which is only a narrow band. It's emitting radio, uh, parts in the radio part of the spectrum. And so we've got radio astronomy to listen to that. OK. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so if you look at where it's kind of tall, that's where it blocks. So it blocks gamma rays and x-rays but also blocked most of the infrared spectrum um, best observed from space. So there you go. So if I want to see in the infrared, and so maybe there are star, cooler stars that emit most of their light in the infrared. Or if I just want to observe our own sun, but not in the visible, but in the infrared, uh, a space telescope is going to be a lot better for that. Cool. OK, we have 18 minutes left. What I'd like to do for the next 18 minutes is start talking a little more in detail, like I said, about the electro part of the electromagnetism. Yeah. So pretty much what we've been focusing on, I don't know, for the last several weeks has been this one guy, the photon. So the photon, now we're now very familiar with the photon, right? It's electromagnetic wave. Here's a picture of a photon. It's just electromagnetism. We're all very familiar with that. Um, a couple reasons I want to shift gears. First, I've had to sort of skip over the, uh, I've had to just kind of brush over the concept of electric charge and electric field up to now. So I'd like to not do that. I'd like to actually be a little more detailed about what we mean when we talk, when we say electric field. So every time I've pulled this picture up before, I've just said, yeah, that's, that's a wave of electric and magnetic field. I'd like today to talk a little bit more about what I mean by electric field. And to go back to this picture real quick, the way we're going to do that, we're going to mainly focus for the next week or two, we're going to focus on another one of these 17 guys. We're going to focus on the electron. The reason we're going to focus on the electron, the electron is, in our world, the fundamental carrier of electric charge. The electron is the fundamental carrier of electric charge. And maybe I should even explain what I mean by that. So these 17 particles are what we now think make up the entire universe. So we are pretty convinced, we physicists are pretty convinced that the entire universe is made up of these 17 particles. You want to know why the sun shines, why DNA is the way it is, you can basically describe it using these 17 particles. In fact, it's even simpler than that. You and I are pretty much just three of those, more or less. You and I are made up of stuff, stuff is atoms. Atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons are up and down quarks, and then the electrons are electrons. So really, if, you, if I were to take a, just about anything, take my laptop and zoom in on it, eventually I just get to up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. That's all stuff. All the things you and I call stuff is protons, neutrons, and electrons, which is up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. So when I, take, when I talk about protons, those have substructure. Those are made of quarks. When I talk about neutrons, those have substructure. They're made of quarks. When I talk about electrons, I'm actually talking about fundamental particles. I'm talking about you can't get smaller. So that's, a, that's what this picture is. This picture, this chart, is a chart of everything that we physicists think are fundamental. They don't have substructure. You can't get any smaller than that. There are theories out there that say, well, there might be substructure. But um, leading theories right now is that's it. That's the end of the story. We've gotten as small as we can. And the, so the electron is useful for a couple of reasons. One, it's one of the things that makes us up. But also, it is the thing in our universe that, like I said, is responsible for carrying charge. Protons have charge. Electrons have charge. Electrons are much more, I think, useful to us because we can. they're much more easier to manipulate. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about electric charge and electric field. And then we'll look at, hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate it. So uh, before we get to electric charge and electric field, here's a picture of a mass. It could be any mass. It could be a speck of dust. It could be a planet. Doesn't matter, just some mass. And one way to think of mass is something in this universe that creates around it an area of influence that we call a field. And when we're talking about mass, we're talking about gravitational field. So 
here's a picture of our Earth. Imagine the Earth was the only thing in the universe. So imagine, take the universe, clear it out, empty the entire universe of everything, and just put an Earth in the middle. That's all there is, one Earth in the middle. What you would have is around that Earth, going in every direction out into infinity, something called a gravitational field. And field theory and thinking about fields is pretty much the dominant way that physicists think about the universe now. So it's important that we understand what physicists mean when they say field. So there's the Earth. Around it is what we call a gravitational field. The arrows indicate the direction something would feel a force in the vicinity of that field or in that field. So notice, take any massive object, put it near the Earth, it's going to feel attracted to the Earth. That's how the universe works. Take any massive object. It doesn't even have to be a planet. Like I said, clear the universe out, put a speck of dust in the middle of the universe. Every, that, then that will create a field that permeates all space out to infinity. All, if the only thing in the whole universe was one little speck of dust, that would create a gravitational field that would attract everything else. In fact, that's kind of how the universe got to where it is now, gravitational attraction. That's how stars got to where they are and planets, is gravity pulling in dust particles. So the reason we have an Earth is a bunch of dust was gravitationally attracted to itself or to one another and balled up into a, into a ball. And that's why we have a sun and that's why there's stars and galaxies. Gravity is that thing that kind of pulls the universe together and makes it clumpy. We live in a clumpy universe. We've got areas of nothing and then a planet, an area of nothing and then a star, an area of nothing and a galaxy. Our, our, our universe gets pulled into these clumps by mutual gravitational attraction. Okay, so that's a picture right there of a gravitational field created by mass. Let's do another little thought experiment. Take the universe, empty it out, put nothing in the universe except for an electron, a little negative charge. The universe will behave in the exact same way. There will be a field that spreads through all space, all in to infinity, created by the presence of that one electron. Electrons are negative. That's the convention. I think some people blame uh, Ben Franklin for that. I'm not sure if that's true, but um, electrons are negative. So take, take, a, take the whole universe, empty it out, put an electron in the middle, and what those arrows indicate is what direction and how strong a force, uh, any other positive object in the vicinity would feel a force. So take an empty universe, put an electron right in the middle, and then put a proton on the other side of the universe. That proton will be attracted. And so those arrows indicate the direction a positive charge, like a proton or anything positive charge, would feel a force. The only difference between, well, yeah, let's see. I should, yeah, I should go back a little bit real quick just to say, the only difference between all of these objects is pretty much mass and charge and another quantity we call spin, which we might not get into in this class. So it's pretty much three things. So if I want to know the difference between an up quark and a top quark and an electron and a tau neutrino, they're all sizeless, they're all massless. They all, well, not massless, they're all sizeless. They're all, they don't have, they're all colorless, tasteless, whatever. They're, they're very, there's not much dis, uh, distinguishing them. Mass, charge, and spin, that's it. Mass, charge, and spin. So this is mass, and that's charge. So an electric charge creates a field that goes out through all infinity. The difference between mass and charge is that we don't, we're pretty sure there's no such thing as negative mass. So we think all mass is attractive. Take two massive objects in the universe, they'll be attracted to one another. We don't think there's a repulsive gravity. Eh. Not usually. There is, a, there is, there are two types of charge. There's not two types of mass. It's not positive and negative mass, but there is positive and negative charge. And so here's a picture of clear out the whole universe. Just put a positive charge in the universe, and that will repel or push away any other positive charges. That's called a field. Okay. That might be enough uh, description. That might be enough description of field for now. So a field is an area of influence. A field is an area of influence. It, it's a vector, which means it has magnitude and direction. So right now, you and I are in a gravitational field. If the Earth was charged, we'd be in an electric field. Okay. Let's, let's see that in action. We've got about, about 10 minutes. We'll probably spend the next 10 minutes seeing that in action. Let's do that. Here's how we're going to see that in action. 
What I have up here, you don't need to copy down all those, but what I have up here is the triboelectric series. Trib means to rub. If you've ever, tribulation is something that got, puts, is, gives you friction or difficulty. So trib means to rub. I think, yeah. So what you can do is you can actually electrify something using triboelectrification. And here's the reason for that. The reason you can do that, by the way, on the right there, that's a picture of amber. Uh, the Greek word for amber is electron. And so uh, amber has this property that if you rub it, it'll like attract other things. It'll become s static electricity. So basically, when the Greeks discovered static electricity, amber was one of the first things they discovered that typically got staticky, got statically charged. And they discovered, that, unbeknownst to them, they discovered the electron. And so the, the Greek word for amber is actually electron. That's where we get the idea of electric charge. OK. So let's talk a little bit about, yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, this idea of triboelectrification. It's pretty straightforward. As you know, you and I are made up of atoms. So right now, I am atoms. I am water, carbon, hydrogen. And my atoms on, on the outside have electrons. What you may have never thought about is your electrons don't know they belong to you. They don't have your name on them. They have no particular affinity to you. And so if I were to, let's see, if I were to grab something with my hand, my, you could think of my hand as a bunch of atoms being swarmed, a bunch of atoms with electrons just swarming around them. So you could think of yourself as just kind of covered in electrons. I'm going to change my camera. And so when you touch something, that thing you're touching is also surrounded by electrons. So for example, this table up here is wood atoms. Those are just a bunch of protons with electrons swarming around. So when I put my hand on this table right now, my electrons are commingling with the table electron. And my electrons don't know they belong to me. The table electrons don't know they belong to the table. So when I pull my hand away, I have definitely, all with, I mean like 99.99% without a doubt, I have swapped some electrons with the table. Every time I do this, my electrons are mingling with tables. And when I pull away, I now have some table electrons. They have some me electrons. Right now, when you get up and leave here in seven minutes, you're going to leave with some seat electrons. That seat's going to keep some you electrons. It's going to happen. You're probably going to leave with some electrons from the person who sat there before you. It's just going to happen. And so that's just, and that's called triboelectrification, that you are constantly swapping electrons all day long. Now, this series here, this chart right here, shows that some materials have a little bit better, usually win that battle a little bit. So if you're in the negative, down here by Teflon, plastic wrap, that's why plastic wrap works, by the way. If you're down here in the negative, you're probably going to win that battle. So if I take Teflon, let's see, what, am I, what do I have here? I have, I have silk. Where's the silk? Silk's up in the positive, And I have some, uh, I think this is vinyl or Teflon. So when I take silk and Teflon and rub them together, when I pull the, the vinyl, I think this is vinyl, away, it's going to keep more electrons than the silk. So this is neutrally charged, meaning same number of protons and electrons. This is neutrally charged. I do this, and I do this. This is now negatively charged. It has a little more electrons. It stole some from the silk. And I do this, and I do this. I can do that all day long. This is becoming more and more negatively charged. It's becoming charged by triboelectrification. And so when I do that, this is now negatively charged. This is neutrally charged, this sphere here. And let's see if I can attract it. Yeah, if I can attract it, it shows that I have actually charged the thing. And I can also see it here. And I should be able to see it here as well. Let's see. Let's see. There. Um, you might be able to see the leaves. Might be able to see the leaves in there separate. Let's see if I can get this one working. There it goes. Is that one visible on the camera? Is the fact that that's moving even visible on camera? I don't know. Okay. So I just charged that guy. Uh, there. And he's now permanently charged. Um, in the next five minutes, we can talk. Yeah. Let's make that a little bit easier. Let's talk about. 
the one let's see the one I just moved this is what I just moved this is an electroscope and let's see if we can see a little bit of what's going on there so I have through triboelectrification I have charged this rod this rod is now negatively charged the reason it got negatively charged is because I rubbed it on some silk and that that uh, tribal electric series that I had up here a second ago shows me that this is not going to be an even battle every time. So every time I do this, this has this is gaining electrons. So I've actually been able to manipulate fundamental particles of the universe by doing that. So anytime you ever have static electricity, I, I usually stop and think, wow, fundamental particles of the universe, I have just manipulated them very simply. So I've actually gathered negative charges on here. And then when I bring that negative charge up to my electroscope, the, I'm going to chase away the electrons in the top. I'm going to chase away the electrons in the top. And that's what was happening there. So the reason it gets positively charged is because this is negatively charged. We know that like charges repel. I think we know that. So the, like, the electrons in here are going to chase away the electrons in the metal electroscope. And they're going to run away, and they're going to run as far as they can. And where are they going to get? They're going to get to the needle and to that vertical piece. And then all of a sudden, what I've done is I've induced charge in the needle and that vertical piece. I've induced charge by pushing electrons down there. I've made electrons run down there. Um, we've got three minutes left. Let's look at one other way I can show that, and then we'll be done. This is one of my favorite ways. This little wand here is, you can hear it. It's got a little motor in it, and the motor is basically just doing what I was doing here. It's just rubbing two things that are diff on different spots in the triboelectric series. It's rubbing them, and so this is becoming crazy positively charged. It's getting a lot, a lot of positive charge. This right here is metallic. This is a conductor. And so when I bring this nearby, I'm going to do the same thing. Well, actually, I'm not, I'm not even going to put it nearby. I'm going to touch it. So right now, by touching it, I've actually positively charged this thing. So now it's positively charged. Then I should be able to, now that it's positively charged, I should be able to chase it around with this thing. And the reason I can do that is because they're both positively charged. And I'm getting, and I've just lost it. <laughs> At, that is electrostatic repulsion. Me, yeah, go ahead. So notice when you grabbed it. OK, thank you. Thanks. So when she grabbed it, it stopped. It's kind of inflated. It was inflated a second ago. All that, all that excess charge is now on me, and it's kind of back to neutrally charged. So if I want to if I want to uh, charge it up, I need to charge it like this. So I kind of discharged it by touching it. And now I can turn this thing on. And right now, I'm actually charging it, charging it, charging it. Eventually, it becomes so charged that it's repelled from the stick. And I can kind of chase it around like that. And so what I'm doing is that thing right now is positively charged. And I don't even have to turn this on anymore, right? So this stick is positively charged. That's positively charged. And right now, what we're looking at is electrostatic repulsion, two positive charges repelling each other. Now, the way I did that, again, was that they had to touch, and that's called conduction. And I'm going to lose it again. Yep, there it goes. OK, so I was able to, I touched it, that charged it. And then when you touch it, look, it discharged again. It's kind of gone, it's kind of gone back to there. It's kind of gone back to neutrally charged. We've discharged it. And then I can charge it again by touching. The last thing before you pack up, the last thing I do want you to notice before we pack up, the last thing I want you to notice is that in order to charge this, here's how it works. Right now, this thing's pretty much neutrally charged. This is positively charged, especially if I get it nice and positively charged. Watch what happens. When I bring this positively charged object up to this, I'm going to chase the electrons, or I'm going to pull the electrons toward me, because this is positively charged. It's going to, the electrons in this metal, in this conductive ribbon, are going to move toward here. And I'm going to have positive and negative, and it'll be attracted. Do you see that? You see that they're attracted? They're attracted because this is positively charged. I've induced a charge in this thing, meaning I've pulled electrons over. Now I've got positive and negative attracted to each other. That's why it's sticking until I get it so charged up that I can then repel it again. Okay, We'll talk a little bit more about that next class. <laughs>